think there is a certain danger in, um, in luxury. You know, um, we don't know how necessary a certain degree of privation is to motivation. You know, the typical first generation immigrant story is mm. someone arrives with nothing and is, is m motivated fully to do whatever, whatever is necessary to make either themselves or their children a success. And that does seem to uh, decline. That motivation does seem to decline somewhat over the following generations. So, for example, Asian immigrants, um, their children outperform American children in school by a substantial margin. But that disappears by about three generations, that advantage. Wow, that disappears in three generations. Yeah, yeah. As the, as the Asian immigrants become more Americanized, their proclivity to... Um, excel you academically. You guys understand that concept? Well, well, powerful. So I come first generation, I'm more disciplined, my kid becomes less disciplined, my grandkids become less disciplined, and the one prior to that, you know, past that also gets less disciplined. Yeah, well, you, like I said, I mean, and you probably face this to some degree because, you know, you have a lot of resources at your command. It's very difficult to provide your children with optimal um, privation in order to make them to make them stand on their own two feet, you know, and you, you, you don't get people to stand up on their own two feet and to adopt responsibility if everything is given to them. And that, that's, that's a real conundrum. Okay. Well, it's a real conundrum as you become successful because you're in a situation where if your children ask you for something, there's no formal reason for you to say no, you know, because you can provide whatever is being requested. But by doing that, you steal from them the opportunity to generate that for themselves. And that's, I suppose, one of the dangers of, well, it's the, one of the dangers of prosperity. What that does to people over the long run, I don't think we understand well yet because most people haven't been prosperous for very long, right? There's been plenty of privation to go around and of course there still is in many, many parts of the world, including in the United States and in the West. Do, do you think we're getting softer and more sensitive? Do you think in, in general, especially America, because America has been successful now for quite some time, so we're constantly growing. Do you think we are becoming softer and more sensitive? Well, I think there's a push in that direction. Uh, like a, there certainly seems to be a technical push in that direction in think? the universities. Why? Well, it's complicated. You know, my, like, generally when I try to assess something like that, there's a rule if you're a social scientist. And the first rule is, in some sense, to look at context before you look at personality. And I think there's been a lot of really radical changes in our society in the last 50 years, and we don't understand their consequences. The most radical change is probably the birth control pill, um, because it's provided women with voluntary control over the reproductive function, and that's a equivalent to a, a major biological mutation, right? It's, 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 it's consequence is virtually incomprehensible. I mean, partly one of the consequences is, is you know, where you, where reliable birth control is provided to women, first of all, they immediately become educated. Second, their economies tend to grow. And third, the birth rate falls below replacement. And then all three of those factors are monumental, you know, so um, perhaps especially the third, the falling of the birth rate be below replacement, which is the case in virtually every country in the Western world except the United States, um, softness. Well, look, like, we don't know exactly what the optimal conditions are under which you toughen up, let's say. Um, most children now have older parents, right, because people aren't having children until they're in their 30s. And there's a big difference between having a parent who's in his or her 30s and having a parent who's in her, his or her point. 20s. Yep. The 20-year-olds are still kind of like kids, and they're going to be more usefully neglectful, I would say. <laughs> well, look, one, one of the things we used to do with my daughter when she was very little was 
you know, she was about a year and a half, is we'd, we'd have her in a room alone, and she would usually complain about that for a few minutes, and then she'd find a way to amuse herself, you know. She, she liked to take books out of shelves and put them back in, and like, if, if you let her be, get through that initial bit of misery, then she would learn how to regulate herself, and, and she got very good at that. Um, and then, so that's a good example of minor privation having a positive influence. But, you know, children used to have multiple siblings, and siblings toughen you up because there's tremendous competition in families among siblings, and they had younger parents who had fewer resources. And, you know, now parents are older, first of all, and second, they're more resource-rich, and so they're more likely to schedule their children to death, in some sense, to provide them with all the opportunities that they feel would be useful. And that's understandable. And plus, because they have fewer children, each child is, in some sense, more precious. You know, not like if you have ten children, you don't love all of them, but, you know, there's ten of them. There's, there's only so much excess attention that can go around. And they do a, a lot of socializing each other rather than being socialized by parents. But if you only have one child, you know, you're going to devote all your resources to providing them with absolutely everything you can provide them with. And one of the dangers of that is that you'll overprotect them and you'll provide them with too much. And we don't understand those dynamics, right? We, we don't understand how much you should stay hands off your kids and let them go out there and make their own mistakes and, and find their own way. And, and that's, that's, well, that's tricky, and, and we're ignorant about it. And so I think one of the consequences of that is that we do have a reasonable percentage of young people, maybe young adolescents, the kind that you hear about at university, who have been overprotected and overscheduled over and under-challenged in some sense. We extend that overprotection far longer than is helpful. Um, you know, it's hard though, because as I said, when you have resources, you can use them to make your children's lives, let's say, easier. But the question is, like, do you really want to make the life of someone you love easier? And that's an incredibly difficult question. And it's tough because how do you, you know, the whole thing is when your kids go, kids' friends go and say, hey, I heard your mommy and daddy are rich. Why isn't your mom buying you this car? Why isn't your dad buying you this car? But it, it, it was your underlying message you encouraging us? Because there's a lot of Latinos in the room here. Were you trying to encourage us to go out there and have 10 babies? Is that, is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> so kind of, you're talking, they will make 10 babies in a heartbeat if you say that. These are professionals that are making babies here. 